Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Prescription drug abuse, the real story, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Activists in cooperation with the American Medicine Chest Challenge. Barnabas Health, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and Banking under the principle of stewardship. New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. And by QualCare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, prescription drug abuse among teens remains a major problem in the United States. Data suggests that nearly one in five teens are abusing medications not prescribed to them. With us to discuss ways to improve this dangerous situation, in the studio we have Devin Fox is the executive director of Young People in Recovery. Nicole Levine is a 2013 winner of the New Jersey Shout Down Drugs Music Competition. Connie Green, Vice President, Barnabas Health Institute for Prevention. And finally, back by popular demand with us many times is Angelo Valenti, Executive Director, Partnership for a Drug-Free New Jersey. I want to thank all of you for joining us throughout this program. You're going to see a very valuable and important website, great resource, the uh, Medicine Chest Challenge, American Medicine Chest Challenge. Why is that site so important, Angelo? What it does, Steve, is it gives people an opportunity, families an opportunity to help protect their medicine cabinet from potential abuse uh, it gives them tips on how to uh, secure their medicines. It gives them tips on understanding what they have in there because many right. of us don't even know what we have in our medicine cabinet. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to dispose of medicines they no longer need or want. It reminds them not to share their medicines because medicines are prescribed by, for an individual. And finally, most importantly, it encourages families to talk to their children about this issue. There needs to be an open dialogue that medicines can become very dangerous if they're not used yeah. properly. We're actually going to go through some of the, uh, the five challenges, if you will, right. uh, a little bit later on. And uh, I just want to remind folks that this program is not just for young, younger people, if you will, who are dealing with this issue, abusing, if you will, but parents. Because it has been said, research shows, plus anecdotally we know it's true, that if parents don't set boundaries, if parents don't get involved and engaged, then we shouldn't be shocked when all of a sudden our kids are involved in prescription drugs. Fair to say? I think it's fair to say, definitely. Um, you know, and I, I really like the, the Medicine Abuse Project. I think it's a, you know, a tremendous program because the use and abuse of prescription drug abuse for uh, young people you know, who are teenagers and then even going into their uh, young adulthood is, is humongous. Well, by the way, let's take a step back. Sure. Your story. My story. Yeah. I, I'm Devin Fox, and I'm a person in, uh, in long-term recovery. And that means for me that I have a primary diagnosis of a substance use disorder. Um, you know, so I, I went through my, uh, my active uh, addiction, um, and I started when I was 18. Uh, I went to Rutgers. Uh, I went to treatment. And uh, I went back to Rutgers and lived in the Rutgers recovery house that they, that's been there for 25 years. Is it important to say what you were addicted to? Uh, not for me, uh, especially because it's all about um, actually defining uh, what recovery is and then moving forward with the solutions. So uh, for this individual, it was just about anything you put in front of me. Um, but uh, I'm less interested about discussing um, what I used uh, and more interested in how we can help save people's lives. Let's go back to the question of parents. If, let, let's give concrete advice to parents. Someone watching, a parent watching right now says, uh, I'm concerned. But listen, what's in my medicine cabinet, my medicine chest, my prescription drugs are mine. It has nothing to do with my kids, you say. Well, it's not only about what's in your <clears throat> medicine chest. It's about setting clear boundaries for kids. For example? Children need to know 
what are the family values, what's important to this family, and consistency around those values. What are the messages? What do we believe I want a more concrete in? example. Help us on this, Connie. Because everyone's going to say, yeah, you know, well, we have family values, and, and we communicate them all the time. But in a, from a practical point of view, what do we really mean by that? From a practical point of view, it's having a discussion about what's available out there. What are we scared about as a family? What don't we want you to be involved with because we want you safe and healthy and to grow drug-free? And, and it's very hard for kids to make good decisions without having consistent, clear messages about what are those good decisions? What do my parents expect of me? And I kid around very often. I say when a kid makes a bad decision, it's important for them to feel guilty. Guilt is good. So, gu gu oh, whoa, guilt is good. Guilt is good. As a Jewish uh, well, mother, uh, I have the right to say that. You, you do, Connie, but I'm looking at Devin and I'm reading his body well, language. And as a, as, a, as a person, I'm willing to say that, that I think that that's really not unfair. Well, let me explain what I mean by that. When a child makes a decision that's outside of the family values, guilt means I've done something wrong. So that's mm -hmm. what I meant by it. So when they make that bad decision, okay. I've stepped outside of family values. And the research tells us that kids that know what the family values are, that make poor decisions, are, use less problematically. Even if they begin to use prior to the age of 21, with alcohol, they know it's outside of family values. Okay, but every individual is different, and every individual has a certain personality, uh, whether it's an addictive personality or not, whether they're stronger or weaker, peer pressure means more or less to them. Everyone's got their own story. But this is, I find this very interesting. Fact or not, because I'm going to come to Nicole on this, 85% Angelo students are are not using drugs. That's correct. Where does the information come from and how do we know that's true? Well, there are research projects that are undertaken by both the National Partnership as well as the New Jersey Partnership, which shows that most kids are making the right choice. And in this case, 85% is a clear majority of young people are, are not abusing drugs. Do, 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 okay, now, Nicole, let me ask you. You heard what Connie was saying about these important conversations, these honest conversations about family values, et cetera, et cetera. You're part of this organization, New Jersey Shout Down Drugs, a music competition. We're actually going to hear you in just a little bit on videotape. Describe your family discussions about this and what impact you believe it's had on you and the decisions you've made. Well, see, I think that in order to, to grow up, the reason why I don't use any substances is because ever since kindergarten, I know that sounds so young, my parents have always, at dinner table, at the, when we're, whenever we're eating dinner together, um, they'd always tell me, like, the dangers of it and the consequences, and they never hid it from me. They always were very open. From kindergarten? Very little. Because my dad's a doctor, and my mom's a therapist, so it's always been in the sphere, and our, my whole family's all about living a healthy lifestyle, and very repetitive. And they address it at a young age. So n I have no interest in doing that at all. So, but, but talk about the peer pressure thing. Right, you're at Melbourne High School, right? Yes. So the peer pressure thing I brought up, because every kid, and I mean that in a negative way, every younger person, young adult, responds differently to peer pressure. Clearly there are young people, whether it's 15% or not, I don't know, assume that's the number. It's going on around you to some extent. You're saying it has no impact on you. It does have an impact, but I, I have a strong code of ethics because of the way my parents raised me. And I know that I wouldn't put myself in situations where I would be, where I, I'd be under peer pressure. But, but some do. And let me ask you, mm -hmm. and Nanja, I want you to jump in here, too. Mm -hmm. Now, for some people, for some young people, they have a code of ethics. They're brought up a certain way, and they have a certain personality. And to date, she, and we hope that that's the way it stays, it hasn't affected her. What do you think it is in certain people? And I know everyone's different. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to generalize. Yeah. What do you think it is from your experience that causes some to be so susceptible? I think that a lot of times it, um, it could definitely come down to this want to, to feel involved, to feel fit in, to, or, or even maybe perhaps not experience some type of feeling that you're having in your life. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this just happens to be you know, the avenue that you take to do that. Um, pre prescription drugs? You no, know, that could be prescription drugs. That but could be illicit drugs. drugs. But stay on the prescription drugs. Okay. But what is it about prescription drugs? 
So what, the thing that is about prescription sure. drugs is that um, they are easily accessible. Yeah. Um, so they're inside uh, your home usually, and they're and also for, cheaper, if you will, than other drugs. No, am I wrong? Um, with that? Yeah, what, with with copays and things, you know, you know, the script. Uh, you know, my mom, I think, was a, is a county uh, employee, so scripts are like six to eight and eighteen. You know, and it, you know, I think it's it's incredibly interesting how we have a medicine medicine abuse uh, project, uh, and not, we should probably also be discussing like what the plans are um, to expand that program because once uh, whole entire counties now get rid of their opiates, the prescription opiates, what are those kids who are actually physically addicted to those opiates going to do? Sure. Um, are they not going to just drive to Newark and buy uh, buy heroin instead? Uh, because but, it's cheaper. And by the way, you mentioned Ange, and Ange, jump yeah, back in, because it's well, also they, been said that some of these prescription drugs are potentially a gateway to heroin. Am I, heroin, am I wrong about that? that? Without a doubt, we're seeing a direct I'll, link. I'll bring you back in, kind yeah, of, I promise. Sure. We're seeing a direct link between... A direct link? A direct link yeah. between Go ahead. individuals, young people that are being uh, introduced uh, to opiates through the, the medicine cabinet, and then when they dry up, and there is a misperception uh, that, that prescription drugs are safe as well because they're prescribed by doctors, my grandmother takes it, my Must mom takes safe, it. Must be safe, right? Exactly. How, how, Why how dangerous is it not it true? Well, because we know it becomes very addicted. And uh, that, unfortunately, uh, what happens in a certain segment of the, of the individuals that are taking these drugs is that the metabolism, and it's a medical issue, uh, drives them to, to need more. Uh, the, the, the addiction sets in. And then in most cases, when the prescriptions dry up, uh, they become more expensive, not less expensive, because prescriptions on the black market are much more expensive than heroin is. I mean, it could be a significant difference. Mm -hmm. uh, heroin today in New Jersey uh, could be purchased for anywhere between 5 and $10. And very available. Uh, and, and, and very available. available. Very available. Whereas prescription drugs uh, that are not accessed mm -hmm. through the medicine cabinet are much more expensive on, on the black market. Jump back uh, in. Well, we're facing a new dilemma today because... The gateway drugs of the past were alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at prescription medication as a gateway drug, hence heroin use because it's cheaper. And the treatment community as well as the prevention community is facing a dilemma that's never been faced before. There is even now uh, additional uh, detox programs in New Jersey for adolescents that never existed before because well, there wasn't... Be. But there was not a need before. But there is a need now. And now not there is an absolute need. Let me ask you, while we're responding to some extent, is the response even remotely um, strong enough, good enough, based on the demand, based on the seriousness of the problem? Well, absolutely not. Uh, okay, I'll come back to you, Tim. I promise. No, we, we've actually, I think, in New Jersey, have uh, really led the nation in bringing this issue Define to the forefront. Define what that means, the Well, nation. for example, uh, five years ago, before people were discussing this issue, in New Jersey, we held the first ever statewide day of awareness and uh, disposal, mm. safe disposal, of medication. Uh, it, was, it was a great day. Uh, it brought a lot of attention to the issue, and a lot of people became aware of it. Well, hold that, on. Stay right there. Yes. Because we've done some programming on this. Mm -hmm. I believe what you're talking about is the safe disposal of prescription drugs. That's correct. How to get rid of your prescription drugs in the house. Because one of the issues in the medicine chest challenge mm -hmm. that we're going to put up mm -hmm. is what are you doing with your prescription drugs when you decide as an adult, as a parent, that you're not going to take them anymore? But Steve, I think the system what? is overwhelmed at this point. In Devin, what or, do you mean or, by that? But there's so many young people, uh, mm -hmm. 15, 16, right up through, through t into their early adulthood that are addicted at this point uh, based on this introduction through prescription drugs, mm -hmm. moving on to heroin, and uh, I, there's not enough, uh, comp not enough facilities. Well, the to, fact that our state is now funding 30 uh, detox slots for adolescents is unheard of. Mm -hmm. So New Jersey is facing this issue and attempting to put in place services Through that treatment. didn't exist. Devin, yeah. what, what, yeah. do you, what do you think most young people in recovery need when it comes to treatment? Um, a prescription drug abuse? Through, for treatment? Yeah, um, what do you think I it really is? If it's prescription yes. opiates, uh, then they definitely need detox. Um, if it's prescription drugs in general, so that could be um, any other substance, uh, that could be Adderall or um, any, does, any does, substance. Let me ask you something. Do you think it depends, and I don't want to get too clinical here yeah. outside of my area of expertise, yeah. Does it depend upon, does the treatment mm -hmm. for addiction <laughs> depend 
heavily on what you're being treated for? Well, this is a really interesting question that you ask. Uh, in my, I don't know the answer. In my, <laughs> in my, <laughs> but go ahead. I think that it should. I think that, uh, but I don't think that in the United States or in New Jersey we have a loud right. enough voice for the recovering community or people that love the people in recovery or people who are not yet in recovery. Um, we haven't had a loud enough voice to demand money be spent. Um, you know, so that we can fund research to find that out. On research? To find out whether or not the, that treatment needs to be based upon uh, the substance that you, um, that you have, that well, you Well, describe abuse. it, before I get you back in context, describe the Rutgers experience for you. What was sure. that treatment like sure. for you? Okay, and why so, do you think it was successful? Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, I lived in the Rutgers Recovery House. Um, Rutgers Recovery House. Correct. So it was recovery housing. Uh, so it's a dormitory on campus. Uh, you know, not totally secluded out of the way, but you know, in, in a nice enough place where you felt like you were involved in the campus community, but also you know, far enough away where you felt like you know you you weren't like up in the business of Rutgers right. uh, itself. And you know, Rutgers uh, is a is a supposedly um, dry campus. Um, which is, you know, a very Got interesting it. topic to have. Um, so, but the thing is, is that they support recovery. Um, so, but they're, they're not saying, hey, you know, there, you know, you drink too much, or you know, there's a problem with, you know, how much what Adderall they you doing? use. They're saying, hey, you're in recovery. We're gonna, you know, we have a dorm here. Um, come live here and and have a supportive environment to live in uh, while you experience college. Uh, Give me some example of what does support mean. Sure, uh, that means a community of of other individuals who are doing the same thing as you. Meetings. That means uh, p perhaps meetings, depending upon, you know, what fellowship you decide to go to or if not go to, because recovery is not just about the 12-step fellowships. Um, and uh, also, it's, uh, it's really those three things. It's uh, right. having a community, it's uh, going to meetings if you have to, and having, you know, access to, uh, to a counselor that you can see. I want to shift gears. By the way, go log on to the site that we have up there, uh, the Medicine Chest Challenge website great important information. It's a clearinghouse, Ange, it is. to get to everything else that w w people it's, need to get to? It's really a great resource because it has all the information parents need uh, to be able to deal with this issue in, at a family level, and also it provides information about where you can safely dispose of your medicine. And the other thing, N Nicole, I want to do this. The song that you uh, sang is called I Hope You'll Say No, correct? Mm -hmm. First of all, before we play it, describe the genesis behind this. Where did it come from? Why did you sing it, and why is it so important to everyone? Well, I'm very active in the peer leadership program at my school. It's called the peer leadership program? Yeah. Go ahead. And um, so I, my advisor told the group about it, and I've been playing piano guitar since I was eight and writing songs since I was eight, so I thought it would be a great way to merge my, in, my interest in trying to spread a prevention message to my community and also to play my music. And... Um, I also, um, substance abuse related tragedies in my community inspired me to write the song. You've had them? Um, not You've had, the, there's been tragedies? There, yeah. Every fact, community's had them? It's, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. And I, I thought that maybe if I can connect people at an emotional level, then that would reach their hearts and inspire them to say no to using drugs. Would you mind if we played uh, your yeah, music? Sure. This is Nicole Levine, and it's uh, a song that she wrote. It is called I Hope You'll uh, Say No. Here it is. That was at NJ Pack. Yes. And so what was the reaction? Well, it was uh, wonderful to see the audience be so positive uh, for Nicole and for all of our performers because it really is uh, an opportunity for young people who are doing the right thing, who are making the right choice. What is this competition about? I, not competition, I shouldn't say that. What is this event about? It's a peer to peer message. So, what we do at the Partnership for a Drug Free New Jersey is we ask teenagers throughout the state of New Jersey to create original music with an important message to their peers about staying drug free, about remaining drug free. And then we have this wonderful concert that takes place where we highlight some of the great talent that we have, and, and Nicole's a great example of that. And what, what I think comes out of this, which is very important, is that there's an online voting component to this program, Steve. And last year we had 60,000 teenagers mm. visit our site and vote for a prevention song. 
So we know that the message is getting out there. And it's a very different message. I mean, for you or I or some adults to get up there and talk about you know, saying no, it doesn't have the same powerful message as a young person who's living that experience. Peer to peer. Peer to peer. Yeah. Yes. It's uh, so interesting. Someone says, oh, it's either this or that. It's either, it's either a young person talking to another person. It's music. It's, it's a certain treatment program. I'm sitting there thinking about this. It's no one thing. Right. It could be any. There's no one way to help any one person. <laughs> And you have to try a lot of different things. Is that a fair assessment, well, But you said something at the very beginning. Yes, it's complex. Yes. But the parenting issue is the most critical issue. What are most parents, what is the most uh, common mistake that most parents make when it comes? Because you don't control your kids. You can try, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Nor should you even try. What is one of the most common mistakes most parents make who are trying to help their kids and, and be there for their kids to avoid? what so many young people have experienced. I think it's not even knowing what you so brilliantly shared with us at, at, at the age of kindergarten, five, six. It's not too young. An honest conversation about uh, drugs? Always an honest conversation. And for kids to be ready to face the issues of life and know that their family's behind them and understands what they're going through. How about if, how about if a parent says, watching right now, you know, that's great for your parents. Your dad's a doctor, right? Yeah. Your mom's a therapist. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're not professionals. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we couldn't do that. We run mm -hmm. lots of uh, programs, Barnabas Institute for Prevention, called Strengthening Families, and we bring together high-risk families for 14 weeks to learn basic parenting What does that mean? Skills. What does a high-risk family mean? What does that mean? Someone has this addiction in the family already? What does that mean? Addiction in the family, uh, children who are already involved in illegal activity, mm. uh, Kids that are out of control and parents don't know what to do with them and they're five, six, seven years old and they're already in charge of the family and the parents don't know how to take back control. What do I need to do to raise my kids? And this Strengthening Families program is a 14-week program um, that's been, um, World Health Organization has, has determined that is the most significant family program. And it brings them together to teach the skills that parents are struggling with because they don't know. And I think you said, I'll come back to you, too often children are making those decisions when parents should be, jump in there. Sure. Um, and, and I think that um, it's funny that you mentioned the World Health Organization, um, you know, talking about the family perspective because this is a family problem. Uh, this is a community problem. This is a nation problem. This is a New Jersey problem. Um, and, and, and it is important that we have uh, programs in place for parents as well. Um, but the World, the World Health Organization also points out that if you increase access to education, to employment, and to secure housing for young people who are in recovery or are living with a substance use disorder, that it makes it that much easier for them to choose a life of wellness, to choose a life of recovery. Because if they don't have that, that? Because if they don't have that, that, that choice is, is harder to make. Um, and so when you are creating an environment where the, it's, it's easier to say yes, you know, that's important because, you know, you have a wonderful, wonderful and beautiful voice and you're so talented. And I, and I hope that people do say no. You know, I really do. You know, but, but what, what, what happens but when they, they say yes? Say, this is interesting. What if they say on, yes? On, this is so interesting you're saying this. On one hand, we want them to say no. And we want to do everything possible for them to say no. No guarantees, but everything possible to say no. But once they've said yes, then what you're saying, which is so right, is we want to create an environment to give them a reason mm -hmm. to say no. <laughs> well, I'm also I'm also of the mind that I don't necessarily think that just comments, saying right? no. Um, I, I think that that really, in my head, that reminds me a lot of the Nancy Reagan that just say no mentality. That's not enough. Um, and that mm -hmm. is not enough. It's, um, it's not enough. Right. Well, I think it's a start, Steve. I mean, you have to send. You have to, you have to be able to get messages out, and messages. Of, and the message of, is now uh, for the parents. We talked about parents. I mean, it's knowing what your children are involved in. I mean, having spending time with them. Uh, being able to know if there's a slipping of grades, uh, if there's a change of friends, uh, different uh, uh, set of norms, if there if there were a, a child who loved sports mm. and all of a sudden decided to that he no longer or she no longer wanted to be involved change. in the team. By the way, real quick, the other thing, real they know the the five uh, medicine chest got a minute enough. Could do do the five? Could we do it? Do we have time to do it? The five, the graphic with the five. Ange, put it up right there. Could you do it, Ange? Right there. Uh, take inventory of your prescription and over-the-counter medication. Next, Ange, help me on this. The second one is to secure your medicines, keep them out of the reach of children. The third one is to 
uh, dispose of your medicine at, at a location that's safe. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Fourth, the fourth side is to take your medicine as prescribed. Don't share your medicine because it could have detrimental effects on the people you're and sharing finally, with. And finally, most important, talk to your children about, the, about this issue, prescription drugs, and drugs in general. But Steve, there's no... A few seconds, go ahead. There's no guarantee. I mean, one of the things we found is that we, there are wonderful families that are doing all the right things, and unfortunately, you still have children that are, that are abusing. But the, a few seconds. But, but the odds are in your favor. So if you spend time with your children, our research has shown over and over again that they are less likely to be involved in drugs. I promise. So, go, go ahead. Few and, seconds. and also, I think that the parents need to be a role model to their kid. My parents never would... We'll keep talking off the air. Go ahead. Oh, my parents never would... The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Activists in cooperation with the American Medicine Chest Challenge, Barnabas Health, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, New Jersey Natural Gas, and by Qualcare Inc. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. This program has been made possible in part by New Jersey State Nurses Association. Hi, I'm Mary Ann Donahue. New Jersey nurses play a key role in the lives of everyone, from a school nurse teaching a diabetic child about injections, to a visiting nurse helping an elderly mother die at home, or someone like me, a nursing administrator for a health care organization. Whatever the role, nurses are there for you. And the New Jersey State Nurses Association has been protecting the practice of nursing and quality patient care since 1902, because caring for you and your families is what is most important to us.